parents, the child is, goes to the teacher who will guide them. Mean by external moral authority. You use that expression a lot. Materialism has to do with when you are. Hello, welcome back to the course in values and spirituality. We are now looking at the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I would like to begin with a quote by Sister Denise on page 97 of this book, which reads as follows. Article 29 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations in November 1989 summarized the rights of the children with respect to education as follows. The child has a right to education and the state's duty is to ensure that primary education is free and compulsory, to make secondary education accessible to every child and to make higher education available to all on the basis of capacity. Sister Denise, I'm very curious as to why you thought it necessary to include this quote in this segment, in this chapter. The main thing is that people think that a child is a possession and as such doesn't have any rights. That when you become an adult, that's when you acquire rights. And um, I think it's important to point out that the UN, uh, which really thinks about these things and writes out what a human being has rights to. We also have the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, there are conventions that have described the rights of women. Why this is necessary is because the archaic social attitudes don't consider these things to be valid. And again, we're looking at the clash of values, the um, archaic social attitudes which are patriarchy based, which say that the patriarchy has rights and nothing else does. Whereas here, we're saying your rights finish when it impinges on somebody else's rights. So there's a boundary. Uh, that's very interesting. Tell us more about the boundary. Uh, this is a very important value, actually, that um, to do with the idea of freedom and responsibility, which also comes up in philosophy, moral philosophy. If you say, my rights have no limit, um, there's going to be a point where your rights get in the way of somebody else's rights because you don't put a boundary. And, and we need to see these boundaries. You see, um, some families will say, we own this child, and once the child is old enough to work, we have a right to that potential salary and therefore we will put that child out of school so that we can take the money. And that is um, exploitation. So um, one set of values says this is exploitation and the other set of values says, well, this is only an object anyway, so I can do with this object whatever I want. And talking about the rights of a child is seriously challenging the view that a child has no rights by definition. You see, spirituality, which also includes the idea of reincarnation, implies that that child could easily have been your grandfather a little while ago. Bit of a scary thought. <laughs> well, it is a scary thought, but it puts things in perspective because you will respect your grandfather as being senior and having a lot of rights, but as soon as he dies, you don't know where he's gone. Take into consideration reincarnation, that same person takes a new body, and with that 
loses your respect, their rights, and so on, because you look at that body as an object. So spirituality says you need to see the things that are not visible. You go on to say, children and youth who are at school today will soon be making a decisive impact. Education and values promises to provide them with a positive, holistic vision of the future that benefits everyone and imparts core universal values that empower the character integral to our finest destiny. What is it that you wish to let the viewer know as far as the rights of a child is concerned? What is it about humanity that um, minimizes the rights of a child and maximizes the rights of an adult? You know, um, when you consider the question of reincarnation, which is an important attribute of spiritual knowledge, what you're saying is the person is a soul who has come through a number of lives. That means they've got plenty of experience, they have sanskaras, they have a lot that's inherent. And what the conventional view is that a child is like a blank piece of paper with nothing there. And the adult community feels that they are Im imbued with the capacity to make that child good. Uh, to me, that's a very arrogant attitude and also very ignorant um, because it's discounting the inherent qualities of a child and the natural abilities of a child. And also it's assuming, based on some of the religious ideas, that um, a, a spirit is fundamentally sinful and has to be made right by the adults. And um, I would also challenge that idea you know, because spirituality says that a spirit is fundamentally pure. And exposure to life, especially different types of trauma, um, creates the situation where a person gets into negative activity. And so it's a really um, an important challenge, I think, to the status quo to the generally held beliefs uh, by saying that, you know, there is more information available and if you don't take it into consideration, it's at your peril and it's at the peril of society. So um, education doesn't mean putting something into a child the way it's normally thought of. But education is really about allowing the child to emerge whatever is already in there and then take a look at it with an experienced adult. And then the child can work with both the inner and the outer sets of information. And that will empower the child and prepare the child for adult life and then we can have a finer destiny. But the way children are um, thought of and discounted and disbelieved, um, so many times if a child says something that is true, an adult will say, I don't believe you, which means you're a liar. And the child has no recourse. And this is very, very common, you see. So that child is diminished and put down very easily, very quickly, and this is damaging. It will teach the child to stay quiet and create a barrier between the generations. That's not healthy. As I listen to you, I'm wondering what is the definition of uh, respect as far as a child is concerned, as far as an adult-child relationship is concerned? What will make the child feel respected? The adult needs to see that the child is no less of a person than the adult. And how does the adult impart this to the child? By doing what and by saying what? 
You speak to the child as an equal. <laughs> Sister Denise, um, very few know how. They have to learn that. That's what education is about, learning how to see another person as not less than yourself. Um, we tend to look at people as higher and lower, and we learn how to treat people higher and lower. But there's nothing about how do you work with your equals. Because the society doesn't look at equals, it looks at higher and lower. And in the same way that it looks at right and wrong. And so education in values and spirituality is very much about you're a soul, uh, the other one is a soul, and your relationship is fraternal. Uh, the difference in age is a, is a matter of role more, more than identity. Difference in position is a matter of role. Difference in gender is a matter of role. And really challenging the idea that the role is the identity. Okay, uh, you need to expand on that because I think that is the juncture at which many people get stuck. <laughs> they see the child as being um, smaller than them, less than them, and literally a blank canvas in which the adult can impose whatever he thinks is right and wrong onto the child. Especially exactly. if it's a parent and especially if it's a a teacher. Um, I'm not blaming either the parent or the teacher for being like this because that is how society has taught them to be. Unpack the question of role and identity for us please. Well this is really what my whole point is that um, a person all they can see is physical manifestation. They have not trained their eye to see the person within the body. So that is also part of spiritual practice, to learn to see who is that in there. I'll give you a little anecdote. Um, Albert Einstein was thrown out of school uh, because it was very uncomfortable for the teacher to be around someone who was so much more intelligent. And so the teacher just um, penalized that child for asking too many questions and being insolent. And so this is just simple arrogance on the part of the teacher. And a child, a gifted child especially, has a very hard time with conventional education because of the arrogance of the teachers who say, I am the teacher, therefore, I am more intelligent than you, but that is a non sequitur. You may be the teacher, but there's nothing that proves or suggests that you are more intelligent than all the students. And especially nowadays, because students have access to the internet and they can read whatever they want, a student can self-educate themselves to a higher level than their teacher. And this is what's happening quite a lot, is that students get bored in class, so they don't want to go to school because they experience school as being a dumbing down experience, and they are protecting their intellects from teachers who are preventing them from developing. And this is, um, I think, a child has a, a right to that even though the teacher may feel very um, uh, insulted by that. You see, one of the problems is that the people who get jobs as teachers are very often people who fail to get jobs as anything else. And so that you tend to get underqualified people as teachers uh, who um, are undervalued, underpaid, and um, this is why they are just not interesting for a lot of the students who may be very bright. On the subject of the rights of a child, uh, do you have a list 
of the needs of a child and the rights of a child. You mentioned the fraternal relationship, um, which I consider to be an answer to my question, but there's more with you, there's always more. Um, a child has a right to be given due consideration and not just dismissed just because they are perceived to be insulting, which is in, in fact because they're cleverer than the teacher. Uh, when you say due consideration, uh, what do you mean? It's similar to due respect, due regard. You know, if a child is asking a question that the teacher can't answer, the teacher has to say, this question is outside my range. Um, you're clearly um, more advanced than the educational setup that we have here, and we're unable to give you what you need to move ahead better. Now, teacher can never say that because their ego doesn't allow it, but the child has a right to that. So it's very difficult for the rights of child, the rights of a child to actually get uh, given. And perhaps that child can receive a lot of support from the parent, because sometimes a child will be very bright and come from a family with very bright parents and go to a school with teachers who are not very bright. And there it becomes a difficulty because to get special education, education for a gifted child is not so easily available, depending on the country, but not so easily available in India. Uh, the forms of education, the type of pedagogy uh, in some countries, especially in Asian countries, is all about learning by rote. And not everybody is that way. So if you are someone who naturally uh, is given to critical thinking, who can analyze concepts, and your teacher can't, you will be penalized, you will get low grades, and that child will start to doubt in their intelligence. And I know this is something that happened to me at school. Um, they, they couldn't figure me out at all, not at all. <laughs> and so um, I had to really educate myself because in school it just didn't make any sense. But there's a lot of people like that. Mm. What's coming to mind right now in, um, um, from a legal perspective, when there's rights, there's always obligations. Um, or one could say responsibilities. Now that usually applies to adults. Does that apply to a child as well? Well, of course it has to apply to the child, but it's more difficult because uh, the child has a right to be considered um, and recognized, but if the adult doesn't have the capacity, then they can't uh, give that right. And And in the question of the rights of a child. Uh, an another thing to look at is the girl child. The girl child is also a child. And the teacher will view a girl child as not requiring education. So if a girl child is very bright and desires to receive a good education, but is penalized and set aside, you know, that is very much going against the rights of that child. And the thing that prevents the child gaining the benefit of her rights is the prevailing social attitudes about girl ch the girl child. Mm. Um, as I listen to you speak, it seems to me that society has a lot of healing to do. It has a lot of healing to do, and it also has a lot of um, uh, remediation to do. <laughs> and how does it go about uh, remediating itself, especially when um, it isn't common knowledge that there is remediation to be done? I think part of what we're trying to do in this course is to challenge what may be considered as conventional wisdom 
and saying that it may be conventional, but it may not be wisdom. That may be painful for many a parent and teacher to hear. Uh, unfortunately so, but um, you see, any time something is there in place and it is not working or it's working against the interests of those whom it is supposed to serve, it doesn't have any good reason to change because it's doing just fine, but those whom it is supposed to serve are not doing well. So someone has to be, in a way, an advocate for those uh, children. And um, unless the advocate challenges, um, it, there's, nobody's going to know that there's anything to challenge. If you challenge, then it means it becomes incumbent on the conventional system to defend itself. When you have a system which is in place, but it's not serving the interests of those it's supposed to serve, when you have a world view which has failed the people it's supposed to serve, now when somebody comes and does that, they're obviously the bad guy. We're definitely putting ourselves in the position of the bad guy. Mm -hmm. But um, we're saying, okay, we may look like the bad guy, but keep listening, you know. So for that, you have to be very patient. You just have to keep bringing in the ideas. And over time, you know, anyway, there's different things that shift. And once you keep talking about these things, uh, gradually people pick it up and in different parts of the world even, and change starts to happen. I don't think it's effective to force change, but I do think that when something stops working, it loses power. And when you come in as an agent of change, uh, knocking away at something that has lost its power, it falls down more, more easily. And you don't have to knock all that hard, but you just have to keep knocking away. You've stated from the commencement of this course that this course is designed at adults, but I am sure that there are minors reading these books and listening to you right now. There are many children who in their heart of hearts are aware that they have rights, but whose rights are not being acknowledged, who are not being seen, who are not being heard, who are not being validated. Um, what is your message to such a child listening to you right now? It could be hundreds or thousands of children listening to you right now. Definitely there are many. Yeah. Um, and I think my message is uh, we're aware about you and we feel for you and we're with you and we're doing what we can to make you more easily understood, more easily visible and to open up the way for your voices to be heard. That is so beautiful. Coming back to the adults who this course was designed for, um, there are certainly adult teachers and parents who are watching you right now who realize that there can be some improvement in their behavior vis-a-vis -vis the child. How would such a parent or child who uh, has the best intentions in their heart for the children, uh, what do they stand to do? How do they effect change from their side? Where does one begin? This is a mammoth task. Okay, where does one begin? To me, there are many parents who are very dissatisfied with the education system and they have no choice because it's imposed by the state and they would love a way around it. There are many teachers who do not agree with the curriculum that they're paid to teach. Sure, that is quite a dilemma. So I think the existence of parents and teachers who are not happy with the way things are means that, you know, you have an energy for change that I think needs to be perhaps galvanized. 
uh, so that you can go to the um, people who are responsible for making the curriculum and setting up the whole system of education and propose changes that are doable. People who don't have the financial and social privilege, I still feel that they have a right to this. And so we're doing our best to make it available anyway. Uh, thank you, Sister Denise. That was um, very beautiful. I do hope that um, for those parents and teachers watching, as well as children who are watching, I hope you realize that uh, you're not alone in the dilemmas that you're facing in um, your life and you are being supported, maybe not um, physically supported, but there is subtle and spiritual support coming your way. Uh, I thank you for spending this half an hour with us. Take care and goodbye.